just thank you that we can come and worship you today, but we know it's a, a crazy day weather-wise, and we certainly pray for those who may have already been in accidents today or have had falls, um, Lord, that none of them would be too serious, but uh, we just pray for your strength and peace and comfort for each one. And thank you that we can worship you, Lord. We're here for you, and that will uh, be the theme of this first song in Jesus' name. Amen. Let our praise be your welcome. Let our songs be a sign. We are here for you. We are here for you. Let your praise. We are here for you. To you our hearts are open, nothing here is hidden. You are our one desire. You alone are holy, only you are worthy. God, let your fire fall down. Let our shout be your anthem, your renown fill the skies. We are here for you. We are here for you. Let your word move in power. Let what's dead. We are here for you. To you our hearts. To you our hearts are open. Nothing here is hidden. You are our one desire. You alone are holy. Only you are worthy. God, let your fire fall down. Sing that again. To you our hearts are open, nothing here is hidden, you are our one desire. You alone are holy, only you are worthy, God, let your fire fall down. We welcome. We welcome you with praise, we welcome you with praise. Almighty God of love, be welcomed in this place. We welcome you with praise. We welcome you with praise. Almighty God of love, be welcomed in this place. Let every heart adore, let every soul away. Almighty God of love, be welcomed in this place. We welcome you with praise. We welcome you with praise, almighty God of love, be welcomed in this From the clouds, a strange and lovely sound. I hear it in the thunder and the rain. It's ringing in the sky like cannons in the night. The music of the universe plays. Singing, You are holy, great and mighty. The moon and the stars declare who you are. I'm so unworthy, but 
but still you love me forever my heart will sing of how great you are all right ladies gonna have you sing that second verse beautiful and free Singing, you are holy, great and mighty, the moon and the stars declare who you are. I'm so unworthy, but still you love me forever. My heart will sing of how great all glory, honor, power is yours. seat and uh, please listen as uh, Matt's going to be reading a compilation of scriptures we call it my beloved it's uh, scriptures of God uh, speaking to us as his children so uh, please listen as uh, he shares these words I am your father and you are my child I will never leave you never I will watch over you wherever you go I have upheld you since you were conceived, and have carried you since your birth. Even into your old age, when your hair has turned gray and you have grown weak, I will sustain you. I have made you and will carry you when you cannot go on. Because you, you love me, I will rescue you. I will be with you in trouble. I will deliver you and honor you. I will never leave you nor forsake you. So you can say with confidence, the Lord is my helper. I will not be afraid. What can man do to me? Who can separate you from my love? Shall trouble, or hardship, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or danger, or sword? No. In all these things, you are more than a conqueror through me, because I love you. Nothing in all creation will ever be able to separate you from my love, that is, through Jesus Christ, your Lord. So be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid, for I am with you. I am your father, and you are my child. I live with you and walk with you. In the light of these promises, keep yourself pure from everything that contaminates body and spirit, and walk in the holiness out of reverence for me. In our hearts, Lord, in this nation, awakening, Holy Spirit, we desire, awakening for you and you alone. Awake, 
the men if you would uh, start with me and then the ladies sing a second part awake my soul so men start with me like the rising sun like the rising sun that shines from the darkness comes a light Like the rising sun that shines, only you can raise a life. In our hearts. Pastor Gary, if you'd come. Good morning. Well, this has been quite a day. Uh, I think, uh, as Pastor Scott mentioned, we've had a number of people fall, and uh, just uh, keeping prayer, I, I haven't got an update, but uh, Dee Schmelia fell coming out of her house, and so she was on the way to the hospital, and, uh, you know, uh, it's been uh, quite a day, but uh, we're glad you folks are here. Please be careful going home. Uh, watch it. Uh, even though we put the ice on all these things, you know, it gets a little ice underneath it, water on top, and it looks like it's fine, and it's not. So we don't want any broken bones or any uh, head, more head injuries than we already have. Um, I forgot this in first service, so I put it right on the top, so I wouldn't forget it this time. Um, with the brochures out here on the table called Marriage Rocks, 
And there's a Marriage Rock seminar, and Pastor Scott and Lisa are going to be doing this uh, for um, the seminar coming up. It's only $25 now, and it's uh, going the Valentine's weekend. is Friday evening and Saturday evening. Uh, it's for any couples uh, or engaged couples, whatever, uh, who want to be in here. Um, you folks get a chance to register today. If you'd like, you can put your information on the back of this and pass it in. We have to limit it to about 50 couples, and that's going to be tight, only because of the size of our place. We are still collecting Christmas offerings or Fellowship Hall expansion funds, so if you want to give towards that, we want to uh, knock out the two rooms back there and uh, expand our Fellowship Hall so we can have more people for our events and so forth. But at um, any rate, um, if you'd like to sign up for this, uh, since Liz lived, limited to 50, we'd like to uh, get people from the uh, church as well as from the community to be able to come to this. So if you're from the community and listening on our uh, stream live or you're pulling it down on your uh, video or whatever, um, you can just give a call to 267-441-6420. I assume that's you. And uh, you can register over phone with them. But uh, it'll be a great weekend. So I just want to mention that. A couple other things. Uh, today's name tag Sunday. I hope you have your name tag on. If not, you're, you're, you're illegal. In violation this morning. I see my wife's in violation already. <laughs> she didn't get her name tag on the way in. But uh, anyway, we do this only so that we, because there's a lot of times you don't know someone else that's sitting across from you. You've seen them for three years now and you don't know their name. So uh, first and third Sundays, we're going to be doing the name tag Sundays just so that we can continue to get to know each other. And I would encourage you to shake someone's hand during our fellowship time that you may not know their first name and kind of quickly take a glaze down to it, you know, so you can kind of get a first name as we talk uh, about things. Sanctity of Human Life Sundays today, inside your bulletin, there is a brochure um, from Choice One called Faith, Hope, and Love, and it talks about uh, saving, uh, saving children in our nation. I don't have the exact statistics. I heard it the other night on uh, the newscast. Uh, just one example was that um, um, uh, Planned Parenthood gets millions and millions of dollars from taxpayer dollars for uh, every year, and 90% of that goes to um, up towards abortions. And they gave the number on TV, and I'm not going to quote it because I, I don't remember it exactly, and I don't want to be giving misspoken facts, but when they said how many abortions just that one institution has every single year, or this past year in the United States, it was astounding to think of that many children, and we think about taxes and revenues and not having people take jobs and, and, and pay income taxes, and all those kids that would have been born are missing out of society because they've been, uh, they, their lives were taken before they were even born. So um, it's a very definitely an issue that we need to be in touch with. As we do elections, we need to pray for our president and for Congress uh, as we get to a new year. Uh, this week is the Tuesday night, I think, is the uh, State of the Union address. I'd encourage you to listen to it. Find out what the president has to say and where we're going and, and make your feelings known to your state uh, representatives and senators and so forth so we can give a little bit of moral guidance to our community as we uh, talk to, our, to those that are in charge. Um, let's see, what else? Have? Young Adult Fellowship. Is that, uh, where's Jody? Jody here? She may, she's covering a Sunday school class. I th we're still on for the Young Adult thing. We're ready for the church this morning. Isn't it today? Today? Today, I think. And uh, so ready after church. Young Adults? Collect that back, and uh, they should have something for you. Uh, just a little bit of a fellowship back there, and time to get together. Um, we're passing out offering receipts from last year, so if you got an envelope, that's what it is. If you gave in the offering through the envelope system, um, and just ask, uh, I guess, uh, Mary here, and she can, uh, she may have your receipt from last year. If you don't have offering envelopes and you're a regular attender and you'd like to use offering envelopes, um, just uh, ask her also. She can point you in the right direction to. Uh, or to Marty. Um, it's a great way of keeping track of how much you're giving and then getting a tax deductible receipt at the end of the year so you can uh, be accurate in when you're reporting that to the government. I'll tell you another thing it does. Uh, two other things, at least for us. If, if you're giving on a weekly basis, it helps you think when you're going to put that offering envelope on. Well, how come there's three offering envelopes here? You know, kind of keeps you track. But also what it does, I think it helps us because if for some reason there's a mistake in how we've taken care of your offerings, you know you gave more or less than what's on that thing, you can talk to our people so we can make sure that we're keeping an accurate record uh, all the way through of what's given uh, to the church and how you're doing. Uh, I think there's, that's all we have this morning that I wanted to mention specifically except for, oh, team meeting tomorrow night. All team members, please make sure that you uh, um, are, have your budgets given to me today, if you didn't get them by Friday night, into me so that we can uh, have that for uh, Monday night so we can look over that and um, then also bring start writing your reports if you would. Lastly, um, at the beginning of Pastor Scott's sermon last week, I looked at my the front of my Bible and I, I don't know why, I just looked at the inside of my Bible and in the front of my Bible, and, and this would be a good thing for you to do, uh, put dates in the front of your Bible that are important to you so you can, uh, you know, uh, 
the date you came to know Jesus Christ, if you happen to know it, uh, your marriage dates, all that kind of stuff. And I was looking through the front of my Bible, and guess what I found out? 30 years ago today, I was ordained. I didn't realize it, <laughs> you know, but I just happened to be looking there. So, uh, you know, I'd already been pastoring for a while, but, you know, you have to go through the ordination process and everything. And so uh, January 18th, uh, 30 years ago today, was when I was ordained. So um, it's... Uh, for those of us who pastor, I think it means a significant thing. It's a commitment to God, and, and it means someone else, a congregation like yourself, stood there and said, you know, we believe this person's uh, committed to uh, following the Lord and giving uh, the word of truth and uh, follow, I mean, has the right doctrine according to the scriptures, and so um, it's, a, it's a neat time. So keep your pastors in prayer as we, uh, as we minister, that we can do a good job and continue to minister until uh, the end, and we don't have any of those things. Uh, there's another, another phrase, uh, in the, another quote in the back of this, uh, in this book that I found in my Bible that I wrote down from one of the sermons, and I didn't intend to do this. Can you hold this for just a second? We'll be going on a pastor's retreat, pastor wives retreat, for those of us who uh, can make it uh, during that, at the beginning of February, and a few years ago, Keswick, I, I just saw this when I was looking here, and this was really, uh, I think, instructional for us, especially as we look. It says, be grateful and humble without pride. We are all just a few poor choices away from total failure. And so as we look at the marriage the marriage thing coming up, you know, I mean, it just takes, I, mean, I look at so many chaplains and, and officers, you know, that make bad decisions, and, you know, just, that can, that can happen so quickly. So we just have to be humble and uh, stand before God and thank him for the grace in our lives that take us through the next uh, stage as we move on. Let's all take a few moments as we uh, uh, pray to receive our offering, and I just ask, Lord, that uh, as we come to give our offerings to you, we just thank you for the, the generosity and, uh, that you've given to us. We recognize that while sometimes it's hard to pay bills and things get tight for us, that there's a vast portion of the world that would be glad to have $2 a day just to live on and to provide for themselves. We also thank you for the grace in our lives as we see people's lives destroyed uh, throughout the world and, and no chance of repentance and no desire for repentance, and they just kind of um, keep on going on. We thank you for the grace that you have in our lives every day of allowing us to move on and uh, continue on in your grace and in your care. Now, bless this offering as it's given, that it might both uh, bless both the big giver who gives it, but also uh, those who receive the benefits of it, whether it's the gospel of Jesus Christ or whether it's encouragement or building up in their faith. We ask this on Jesus' name. Amen. <laughs>
Today we're uh, going to be starting a new series of messages, which I'm really excited about. I know Pastor Gary is as well, on the, the life of Moses. So we're going to be looking a lot in the book of Exodus. And one of the things that uh, we will see during the course of this book is that the God of Israel ends up becoming a very, very famous God because of the incredible miracles and power that he shows. And so we're going to uh, sing this song that talks about God being the famous one. Let's stand together before we... Uh, head into our message. You are the Lord, the famous one. Famous one, great is your name in all the earth. Sing it with us, come on, the heavens. The heavens declare your glorious, glorious. Great is your fame beyond the earth. The morning star, let's sing it. The morning star is shining through, and every eye is watching you. Reveal thy nature and miracles. are beautiful you are beautiful you are the Lord the famous one famous one great is your name in all the earth the hell We're going to sing that chorus one more time. You are the Lord. Let me hear you now. You are the Lord, the famous one, the famous one. Great is your name in all the earth. The Let's greet each other.
each other before you sit down today. He's got to unplug. I know you'll see me through. I try to run and hide from this feeling deep within. Your love is just too strong. And you saved me from my sin. Call to me. Okay, if you have your Bibles, if you take them and turn to Exodus chapter 1, Exodus chapter 1 is we're going to start this very, very exciting series on the life of Moses. So many lessons for us to learn. Inside your bulletin is a set of notes, and I'm going to do my best to try to scroll through a lot of this, uh, not just information, but some principles that will help all of us in our lives. It's important as you study a book of the Bible to know the history, you know, what led up to the place and time that the author wrote this. So Moses in Exodus is in a place and time sitting in a land called Egypt. And um, it's important to know what led up to his being there. And so Genesis is obviously the first book of the Bible. Exodus is the second. So I want to give you a little history lesson that's going to come up on the screen. Some of you can predict maybe some of the key words uh, to this um, analysis of Genesis. But Genesis chapter 1 and 2, what would be the key word in Genesis 1 and 2? Very beginning. Creation. creation. Very good. In Genesis 1 and 2, we read about God in the beginning creating everything that exists, everything that we see, including human beings. And he said everything was good, very good that God created. There was not a flaw in it. But in Genesis chapter 3, what happened there? It's known as the fall of man that's when uh, Adam and Eve chose to sin against God the only commandment God gave them was to not eat of that particular tree the fruit and of course that's what they did and because of that sin enters the world everything changes and this world is under what we call the curse of sin and all of us struggle with sin every single day but we know that God is working throughout history to provide a solution for that problem. In Genesis chapter 4, we read about two brothers. What were their names? Cain and Abel, the, the sons of Adam and Eve. And we read about in chapter 4 the first murder, the first death that we know of recorded in human history. Uh, Abel being killed by his own brother Cain. In Genesis chapters 6 through 9, the main character is a man named Noah. And uh, sin really, over hundreds of years, becomes even worse of a problem. So much so that God said that the wickedness of man is so, so bad, is so great, that I'm going to destroy the earth with a flood. But he counted Noah as a man of faith. He counted Noah not as a perfect man, but as a man who loved God, a man who was faithful to God. And he said, Noah, I'm giving you the heads up, and here's what I want you to do. I want you to build a big boat called an ark, and I want to save my creation as far as animals. So two by two, the animals came. And God destroyed the earth with a flood, but Noah and his family were kept safe and basically started over after the waters subsided and began to once again fill the earth with children. And years later, uh, there would be a very important man. His name was Abraham and his wife, Sarah. Genesis 12 through chapters 25 uh, kind of give his story. And it says that God talked to him and said, Abraham, I want to do something special in your life. And I want to do something special through your, your children um, that you're going to have through Sarah. And so he said, I want you to leave Ur of the Chaldees, a particular area where he was very comfortable he says, I want you to go to a land that you, you aren't even aware of, and I'm going to bless you in that land. 
And so we learn about what's called the Abrahamic covenant. A covenant is a, a promise of God. And three things God promised Abraham in this covenant. Land, seed, and blessing. Uh, the nation of Israel uh, right now encompasses almost all of it, but actually there's a good portion of it that's still not part of what was promised to them that they occupy today. Um, one day that'll be made full. And of course, seed refers to children. And God said, Abraham, through you and Sarah, I'm going to uh, out, you know, the, the number of the sands of the seashore are going to be the number of children that are going to be a part of the nation that's going to come out of you. And so we know the, le the nation of Israel began as Abraham, Father Abraham. And so Abraham would be blessed. He only had one son, and that's chapters 21 through 35. His name was Isaac, at least one son through Sarah. And uh, Isaac was uh, blessed of God, Isaac and Rebekah, his wife. And you remember when Isaac was just a boy that uh, his father Abraham was asked by God to do something crazy to take his one and only son, who God said was the son of promise, up on top of Mount Moriah to build an altar and to offer a sacrifice. Normally they would offer animals. God said, I want you to offer your son. I want you to slay your son, your one and only son, to show your trust and gratitude to me. And so Abraham, by faith, went up and was about to bring that knife down upon his son Isaac. And, of course, God stopped him and had a ram waiting to take his place, and that ram representing what Jesus would be for each of us, taking our place and sacrificing his life. In Genesis chapter 25, and again, you know there's some of the overlap, right? Because, you know, fathers and sons and children, you know, uh, overlapped in, in time. But in Genesis 25 through 50, we read about a man named Jacob and his wife, Rachel, we read about Jacob being the son of Isaac who wrestled with God, bought his brother's birthright from him, his Esau, his brother, and ultimately had 12 sons who would be the 12 tribes of Israel. One of those sons is the focus of Genesis chapter 37 through 50, and though all the sons were important, we read more about this one. His name is Joseph. He was a dreamer. Uh, God actually gave him dreams. And, of course, when he shared them with his brother and his parents, they weren't so happy about uh, what they thought those dreams meant. His brothers betrayed him. His brothers sold him into slavery in Egypt. And ultimately, years later, God would bless Joseph, starting out as a slave, to ultimately be second in command in the nation of Egypt, one of the most powerful nations. And ultimately, it was Pharaoh and then this Jewish guy named Joseph, who was pretty much placed in control of a lot of the operations of the land of Egypt. Why? Because he had incredible wisdom and insight. God showed him through a dream that there was going to be a, a massive famine that was going to destroy the land and people. And so Joseph knew how to prepare for it, and he was placed in charge and ultimately rose to great power in the land of Egypt. And Egypt ends up becoming, in many ways, a home away from home for people of Israel, because we know his father and his brothers would ultimately join him, as we're about to read. So in your notes, next point after the history lesson is a key prophecy, and the key prophecy is found in Genesis 15, verses 13 through 15. Many times God prepares people for what's going to happen, and in this particular context, God is talking to Abraham and saying, I want you to know about something that's going to happen to your children, to, your, you know, to those who are coming after you. He says, Abraham, know for certain that for 400 years, this is pretty specific, 400 years your descendants are going to be strangers in a country not their own, and that they will be enslaved and mistreated there. But I will punish that nation that they serve as slaves, and afterwards they will come out with great possessions. You, however, will go to your ancestors in peace, and be buried at a good old age. Pretty amazing how specific the Lord is in preparing Abraham and just letting him know this is what's going to happen because absolutely what was predicted it ha is happened just like God said it would. So where do we find that fulfillment? We find that fulfillment in the book of Exodus, the very next book after Genesis. So let's take a look at Exodus chapter 1, and in a moment we're going to start reading 
uh, verses 1 through 7. But let's talk about Exodus for a second. What does the word Exodus mean? It means to depart, to go out, or coming out. And you kind of see that little part of the word in the word exit in English, to exit. So for obvious reasons, uh, the name Exodus is, is the right title for what God was going to do. The main character of the book of Exodus is who? Oh, you would say Moses. I always say no. I always say God is the main character of every book of the Bible. Yes, Moses is an important character, uh, humanly speaking. But it's always about God, not about us and what God is doing in this world. So the main character is God. It's Yahweh. He is the main character of all of human history. What's he doing in history? Well, ultimately, he's bringing glory to himself. But how does he do that? He uses individuals to be an instrument to bring about his amazing plan. And Moses would be that main instrument that we'll read about in the book of Exodus. Who's the author, the human author of the book of Exodus? Anyone? Anyone? It would be Moses. In fact, Moses wrote Genesis, and Moses wrote Exodus. The meaning of the word, or the name, I should say, Moses, is very significant. In the Hebrew, the name Moses means to draw forth or to draw out. To draw forth or to draw out. Put that in your notes. And it's actually a pun or a, a play on words in Hebrew. So how would the name Moses, meaning to draw out or to draw forth, be a pun? Well, there's two things about Moses and his life. Number one, when he was a baby, if you'll remember, and we're going to talk about this next week, he was put in the Nile River, saved in a basket. And it says that he was drawn out of that river by Pharaoh's uh, daughter. Secondly, God would use Moses to do what with the children of Israel? Ultimately, to draw them out or to bring them out of the land of Egypt to the promised land. So that name Moses, he's given that name for a reason. It is a pun to, to be drawn out or to draw forth. The major theme, this is in your notes, of the book of Exodus is God's deliverance. But I want to remind you that this is also uh, the main theme of the Bible as a whole. The fact is that all people need to be delivered in their lives from bondage. History always tends to repeat itself, especially as God's involved in it. But we all need to be delivered from sin, death, hell, and from the devil who's called the God of this age. And so there's lots of foreshadowings of things that would come. And we, uh, in Genesis, read about Eve's seed who would crush Satan's head. We read about Noah being delivered. We read about Isaac being delivered on Mount Moriah. We read about Joseph being the deliverer of Egypt with the famine. And now Moses is going to be the deliverer of the Israelites from the land of Egypt. Ultimately, all of that foreshadows the coming of an ultimate deliverer, an ultimate savior. His name? Jesus Christ. And so Moses, in a very real way, is a, a type of or a foreshadowing of what Christ would be for all of us. The key verse, I believe, in the book of Exodus, in my opinion, Exodus 14, 13, says, Do not be, what? Afraid. And I'd love for you to write this down in your notes. You just have the text, but you need to write down this verse. Do not be afraid. That, by the way, is the most often given command of the Bible. Fear not. Stand still and see the salvation of the Lord. What an important message even for us today. So many times in our lives, you know, we, we want to take control. We want to fix all of the problems. We want to make things happen. And, and here in the book of Exodus, the children of Israel are told, don't be afraid. Stand still and see the salvation of our Lord. And sometimes it's through difficult circumstances that we can't control that God ultimately shows his power. The key country in the book of Exodus is what? Is Egypt. And we're going to see a map of Egypt coming up. You can see it there on the left hand side. You see two uh, waterways. One is a river running up through the middle. What river is that? Most important river in Egypt? It's the Nile River, which, by the way, is the only river in the world that runs from south to north. Every other river in the world runs north 
the south. It's a very, very special river that runs through and fertilizes uh, that whole area of the world. And so Egypt, um, you know, we'll talk more about how they viewed the Nile in just a second. The other body of water you see to the far right, that's the Red Sea, the Sinai Peninsula, and right above there is the nation of Israel, right up to the right side of the Mediterranean Sea. So Israelites would come down to the land of Egypt. Egyptians would go up to the land of of Israel, but Egypt had no reason to go to Israel, did they? Always seemed like the Jews were coming down to Egypt in their times of need. What do we know about um, the nation of Egypt during this time that, that Moses lived? A couple of things. Number one, they worshipped Pharaoh or the king as God. And this isn't in your notes, but you can certainly write it down. They worshipped Pharaoh as, as a god, small g. He was like the son of God. He was a deity, and so they would worship him. But not only was he deity, not only was he a god, but a lot of other things were gods too, including they worshipped the Nile River. That would make sense, right? Because without the Nile River, you know, they wouldn't be able to, to live and survive and grow all the things that they grew. So the river was a source of life for them, and there was no rain necessary because of the river. Uh, high, they were also a highly civilized people, uh, educationally, the arts and culture, very rich. And uh, because of that, they kind of looked at themselves very highly, and they looked down on other people, certain other people. Specifically, the Egyptians looked down on Bedouins, or tent, tent dwellers, and shepherds. That doesn't mean there weren't any Egyptians who had that occupation, but they were, they were lower class people. Right, And, of course, the Israelites were known as shepherds, caretakers of livestock, and so forth. So in a symbolic sense, when we look at the nation of Egypt, Egypt kind of represents the world, the dark world that we live in, and worldliness. Okay, And Pharaoh, the head of that nation, is a type or a representation of Satan, the ruler of this world keeping people in bondage, putting people in bondage. So there's a lot of symbolism here and a lot of word pictures that are important for us to, to understand as we go through this incredible book. So let's look next at uh, the notes from chapter 1. There's three sections here that I want you to, to note. The first is chapters, uh, chapter 1, verses 1 through 7. It says in verse 1, Now these are the names of the sons of Israel who came to Egypt with Jacob. They came each one with his household, Reuben, Simeon, Levi, Judah, Issachar, Zebulun, and Benjamin, Dan, and Naphtali, Gad, and Asher. All the persons who came from the loins of Jacob were 70 in number. But Joseph was already in Egypt. Joseph died, and all his brothers, and all that generation. But the sons of Israel, it says, were fruitful and increased greatly and multiplied and became exceedingly mighty so that the land was filled with them. So what's the title of chapter 1, verses 1 through 7? It's that Israel's children multiply. And what's interesting is verse 1 starts out by saying, now, that's how he's starting this book, by saying now, which means it's a continuation of the book that was written prior, the book of Genesis. Exodus is a continuation. Now, Moses says, let me remind you of Jacob's family. Let me remind you of Joseph. So he reintroduces the history of how they got there. And how many people did we just read? When Jacob and his family came and they met up with Joseph and they stayed in the land of Egypt, how many people came total? There was 70 70 people in this family. And what's amazing is that 70 people in 400 years ended up becoming close to 3 million people. They estimate between 2 and 3 million uh, Jews ended up by the time Moses is writing or uh, being mentioned here in Exodus. So God was being faithful to his promise to Abraham, wasn't he? That I'm going to bless through your seed, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and now through Joseph and his brothers. Seventy of them in Egypt, now almost three million people. That's amazing. 
And of course, we know that when Joseph, being the head, um, one of the, the head guys in Egypt, you know, his family, when they came up, Pharaoh said, hey, let's take care of your family. And so they settled in a land called Goshen. Goshen is a, a, a little suburb of, uh, as part of the main part of Egypt. And uh, pretty much Pharaoh said, well, let's settle in your family, Jacob's family, in the area of Goshen. And you can see it down on the bottom right. It's actually not that close to the Nile River. I mean, the closer you are to the, the waterways, the closer you are to the Nile, the closer you are to really good land, really fertile land. They didn't put the Israelites that close to the Nile. They were several miles away in an okay area, an area that was probably better for or okay for raising livestock and things. And so that's where they basically stayed. The word Goshen actually literally means mound of earth. And, but what's interesting is even though Pharaoh allowed them to stay in that part of Egypt, God blessed the Israelites like nobody's business. It says that they uh, were healthy like trees and like healthy trees, they were fruitful. And it says God blessed abundantly in every way. So if you're in, writing in your notes, they were health, like healthy trees, they were fruitful. And God abundantly was blessing them. One of the ways God was especially blessing them is with children. It says that they increased greatly. And in the Hebrew, you get the idea of, uh, of this concept of, of like fishes. Now, how many of you have ever had a fish tank? Aquarium. Some of you may still have one. I've got one in my house. Now, years, I always was intrigued with them, but I mean, the only fish I ever had growing up were goldfish that usually within a day were floating upside down. You know, you get them from the carnival and they never last too long. Uh, then my next experience was uh, betta fish. Some of you know what betta fish are, right? Do you put them in, in a whole group? No. No, you don't put betta fish in with other fish. They're, they're, they're fighting fish. So betta fish always come in one little tank by themselves normally. And, um, and even those, you know, I, they would last for a while as long as I changed the water, but eventually the betta fish started swimming upside down, motionless as well. That's how good I've been with fish. But finally, somebody taught me a little bit more about how to take care of fish. Now we have an aquarium. Still struggled a bit, but all of a sudden, this one time, um, I noticed two fish that were kind of hanging out and, and shooing all the other fish away. Why? Because there were eggs that were being fertilized. Babies were on the way. And uh, it was an amazing process to watch. And you could not believe how fast these things multiplied. And when these eggs were fertilized, and all of a sudden there were these little fish. It looked like two, just little eyeballs, you know, swimming around the tank. And we had like, you know, like a hundred of these little fish. Now, they didn't all make it, obviously, but I'm trying to give these things away. And even recently, within the last three months, we had uh, babies in our tank of little cichlids. So if any of you need fish, please let me know. I'll give you a bunch of them. Because fish tend to multiply like crazy. And that's the word picture here with the nation of Israel. Like fishes, they greatly increased. I mean, the women got pregnant easily. And, and many of them had twins, and, and very few of them had miscarriages. It was, you know, obviously something God was doing as well. But so let's look at verse 8. So how did the Pharaoh view this? It says, a, a new king arose over Egypt who did not know who? Joseph. And he said to his people, Behold, the people of the sons of Israel are more and mightier than we. Come, let us deal wisely with them, or else they're going to multiply, and in the event of war, they'll also join themselves to those who hate us and fight against us and depart from the land. So they appointed taskmasters over them to afflict them with hard labor. And they built for Pharaoh storage cities in, in Pithom and Ramses. But the more they afflicted them, the more the Israelites multiplied, and the more they spread out, so that they were in dread of the sons of Israel. The Egyptians compelled the sons of Israel to labor rigorously, and they made their lives bitter with hard labor in mortar and bricks, and at all kinds of labor in the field, all their labors, which, were, which they rigorously imposed on them. So the Israelites end up going from this blessed people growing in a little portion of the land of Egypt to three million people, probably you know, almost as big or, or growing faster than the Egyptian 
culture. And so now all of a sudden they're being enslaved. Why? So the title for verses 8 through 14, the Israelites are enslaved. Why? Well, number one reason, there's a new king in town. There's a new sheriff. There's a new pharaoh. His name is Ramesses or Ammonifus, which um, sometimes they would give other names to the pharaohs besides just one name. And this new king, it says, didn't know Joseph, verse 8. For whatever reason, they didn't remember the history 400 years earlier how this guy Joseph, who was an Israelite, came and Save the nation because he knew about this famine and he was so smart he knew how to store up the grain that they were going to need they became the rich nation that everybody came to the pharaoh didn't remember joseph he didn't remember that you no know, his forefathers were looking favorably at the family of joseph of jacob that they provided this land and that they were thankful and grateful for what joseph and his family provided and so why were they enslaved? There's a new king in town, and that new king was driven by fear. Fear drives him to afflict the Israelites. He was afraid, and what do you do when you're afraid of somebody? Well, you, you show them who's boss, you know, you show them you're stronger, and so they put them under horrible affliction and, and made them uh, make bricks from and mortar, which um, I was looking at uh, some of the history of Egypt and, and this was not an easy process to make brick you're out in the sun like all day long in this process of making these bricks and then carrying them where they needed to go and there was other it says hard labor aspects that they did in fact the hieroglyphics show large groups of laborers particularly the Jews um, and other nations that they had conquered working under these officers with heavy whips I mean that's what the pictures of the hieroglyphics showed so why this persecution? Well, Egyptians, by the way, hated shepherds, right? Bedouins. Why this persecution? Pharaoh feared the Jews because they had come so strong. Possible that maybe God was providing discipline for the nation of Israel. We don't know that for sure. But most importantly, I think, God was preparing his people, the Israelites, for the exodus. He was preparing them for Moses. You know, hindsight's always twenty twenty. I understand. But ultimately, God didn't want his people to stay in Egypt forever. He promised Abraham, first thing was what? Land, seed, and blessing. And so God was going to bring the people out of Egypt to their own land. They could call their own, a land filling with milk and honey. And so I don't know about you, but... You know, sometimes it's true in my life too, and it's probably true in your life. Sometimes when, when difficult things happen and maybe you're being mistreated, sometimes we don't always see what God is doing behind the scenes. And sometimes um, He's working to bring about a better plan for us, though we don't always see it. So, what's interesting is that the more Israel was afflicted, the more God blessed them. And it brought, of course, even more fear to Pharaoh. So he ends up deciding to do the unthinkable, as we read in verse 15. So the king of Egypt, the Pharaoh, spoke to, his, to the Hebrew midwives. Who are Hebrew midwives? They're the obstetricians. They're the ones that deliver the babies uh, of the Jewish women. You know, they're the ones uh, helping to make sure that the, the safe delivery takes place and the care of the baby. They were all trained. But it says in verse 15 that the king of Egypt spoke to the midwives, one of whom was named Shifra, and the other was named Pua. And he said to these two women, when you are helping the Hebrew women give birth and see them upon the birth stool, if it's a son, if it's a boy, then you shall put him to death. Wow. But if it's a daughter, then she shall live. Well, why is he doing that? Well, who's the strength of the nation? Who are the soldiers of the nation? It's the men. And if you just have a bunch of girls and no men, guess what? First of all, your numbers are going to come down. Second of all, you're not going to have men to provide, protect um, your family, your group, your nation. 
So it says, uh, the midwives feared God, verse 17, and they did not do as the king of Egypt had commanded them, but let the boys live. So the king of Egypt called for the midwives and said to them, why have you done this thing and let the boys live? The midwives said to the Pharaoh, I love this, here's their excuse, well, because the Hebrew women are, are not like Egyptian women. They are vigorous and <laughs> they give birth before the midwife can get to them. I mean, these women are just, you know, they're so quick. They push the babies right out, man. They're get, you know, having babies before we can get there. It says, so God was good to the midwives, and the people multiplied and became very mighty because the midwives feared God. He established households for them. And then Pharaoh commanded all his people, saying, every son who is born, you are to cast into the Nile, and every daughter you are to keep alive. So, title for this section of the, of the scriptures verses 15 to 22 the midwives refuse to kill the babies in particular obviously the male children uh, what was pharaoh trying to do what's it called it's called infanticide it's called putting to death babies um, and also some of you will remember our message right after christmas when we talked about you know the wise men who wanted to come and worship the baby jesus and they were forewarned by God to go a different way. And then Joseph was forewarned by God to go actually down to Egypt. Why? Who was going to try to kill all the male children in Israel? Herod, you remember? I mean, this is a foreshadowing of what would happen in, in Christ's day. Amazing. Another interesting part of the story that I read in, in Hebrew history is by this uh, gentleman named Jonathan Ben Uzel. And this gentleman, uh, this is not a scripture passage, this is just history um, of, of, a, of a legend that was passed down that um, Pharaoh, basically let me just read it to you. It says that, that Pharaoh slept and saw in his sleep a balance, okay, kind of a scale. It says, and behold, the whole land of Egypt stood in one scale. And it says, and a lamb stood in the other. And it says, in the scale in which the lamb was, it outweighed that which was the land of Egypt. So in this hand is what? This part of the scale is the lamb, and, and this part of the scale is Egypt. It says, immediately... He called the chief musicians and told them his dream. And Janus and Jimbris, who were the chief of the magicians, opened up their mouths and said to Pharaoh, here's our interpretation. A child is to be born in the congregation of the Israelites, whose hand shall destroy the whole land of Egypt. It says, therefore, in the history books, Pharaoh spake to the midwives. Interesting. So who would that baby be, by the way? Moses would be that baby who would lead Israel out of Egypt. And, um, so it's interesting that that could have been part of the motivation of why would, why would he actually kill these male babies. And so what we do read, of course, and it kind of connects uh, into today, which is Sanctity of Human Life Sunday, um, it's a case of civil disobedience. Put that in your notes, please. The midwives refused to kill the, the children. They feared God more than they feared the king. And these two ladies actually go down in history and is being recorded in the Bible. Shifra and Pua are mentioned, and they are heroes. They really are. They probably understood the, the teaching of Genesis 9, 6, where it says, whoever sheds innocent blood shall have his blood shed. These two women were probably the ones who headed up and trained the group of midwives, and that's why Pharaoh would talk to them and say, this is what I want you to instruct all the midwives to do, which, of course, they didn't. And so uh, they are truly heroes. Now, next week, we're going to look at the birth of Moses and how, remember, the command was to throw them into the Nile. So we're going to see what happened and how Moses' was, life was spared. But let me give you four key principles before we close today. Four principles that we need to interact with based on this chapter. Number one, God is still in the business of delivering people from bondage. 
It's the major theme of Exodus. It's the major theme of the Bible. And hopefully it's a theme that you have some point in your life embraced, that you needed deliverance. Or you still need deliverance. You need salvation. You need to, to come to faith in the Savior that God provided. Not just the theme of Exodus, but the whole Bible. And Moses was a foreshadowing of Jesus Christ who would come to deliver us from sin. So have you been delivered? Have you been saved? You say, well, how? Well, number two answers that question. It's by faith. It takes faith on our part to accept and to experience God's deliverance. Just like it took faith for the children of Israel to follow Moses, it takes faith for us to follow Christ. And the first act of faith is asking Him, receiving Him as our personal Savior, and then attempting our best to follow Him the rest of our days on this earth. The third point is that God wants His people, Israel and the church, to be separate, to be different from the world. Here are the Israelites living in a land of Egypt in a little area called Goshen, and uh, they were very different than the Egyptians. They held on to their faith, and they held on to their culture. They didn't just blend in. If they had just blended in, they, they wouldn't have been such a threat. And the fact is, we as Christians are not supposed to blend into the rest of the world, especially when it comes to the world's ethics and morals, the way the world thinks, the, the values of this world. We're supposed to be different. And so whether it's our kids at school, whether it's men and women at work, whether it's where we socialize. Are you just blending in, or do people know there's something different about you? We're supposed to be different. And in being different, we're a light in the dark world. And number four, God wants us to obey Him, even if it means disobeying human authorities. It's called civil disobedience. If the nation of the United States of America ever asked you to do something, that you believe with all your heart is totally against what God wants, then you respectfully, respectfully choose to obey God rather than man. But God wants us to obey Him even if it means disobeying authorities. Those Hebrew midwives obeyed God even though they risked punishment. God honored their obedience. And God's people over the years, by the way, have faced all kinds of persecution because they have courageously stood up for their faith. The church around the world is a great example of being able to read, even today, some of the things that are taking place as Christians are saying, you know what, I have to obey God rather than man. So let's have a word of prayer and then let's, let's try to apply these truths to our lives this week. Our God and Father, I thank you again so much for uh, the life of Moses and we're just getting started here in this book of Exodus. But God, I'm excited to see the things that we're going to learn, how we're going to grow as passionate followers of your Son, Jesus Christ. Father, thank you for coming to our rescue and sending Jesus to be the one and only Savior. We celebrate him as we close today in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand together as we close with a great song. second verse, my whole life. My whole life I place in your hands. God of mercy, humbled I bow down in your presence at 
foreshadowed your one and only son Jesus who gave up everything so that we could know you to love you to be saved from our sins to have purpose and meaning in this life and as that bridge of that song says in my life in our lives Lord be lifted high and our world be lifted high and our love be lifted high God we look forward to uh, your blessing in our lives as we strive to live for you this week in Jesus name